In a world now dominated by contracts and exclusivity deals, it may surprise you to know that for the majority of NASCAR's existence, the question of tire suppliers was fairly open-ended. At first, there were very few regulations in place, if any at all. You could pretty much run anything you wanted to. The 15-inch rim has been a constant, even up to today, but width, tread type, material used, and even manner of construction have changed drastically over the years. Firestone was the undisputed king of racing tires in America by the mid-20th century, but the newly emerging phenomenon of stock car racing was throwing them some curveballs. The cars were absurdly heavy, and the speeds were increasing drastically with each passing year. In 1950, NASCAR held their first event on a paved surface in just their second year of competition, and it wasn't some half-mile oval either. This was the Lady in Black's first appearance, the first race at Darlington Raceway. The speeds were way too much for the average racer's tires to handle. Whether they used fire stones or some old dirt track tires they had lying around, no one could survive out there long enough to get a good run going. Legend has it that crews even went out into the stands and parking lots and raided tires from passenger vehicles. It took over six hours to complete the race with an average race speed of 72 miles an hour. People traveling to and from the race probably drove faster than that on the way home. This was, for all intents and purposes, really the first tire disaster in NASCAR history, and it was just in the second full year of competition. The man who won the race was an unknown driver from Indiana named Johnny Mance, the 43rd starter out of a 75-car field. It was his first and only victory in the series, and it came in just his third start. He won by nine laps, simply because he pitted far less often than anybody else. As it turned out, he had fitted his car with heavy-duty truck tires. Since there was no rule against it at the time, NASCAR had no choice but to let the win stand. The Firestone would up its game and provide reliable rubber thereafter. But by 1954, Goodyear had thrown its hat in the ring. And at Darlington Raceway, utilizing tires made for police cruisers, they unseated Firestone as the undisputed tire supplier in NASCAR. What ensued was a 20-year tire war that saw only one disastrous event at Talladega in 1969, and I'm pretty sure we all know how that one went. Firestone would hang on for five more years and bow out in 1974, leaving Goodyear as the lone tire manufacturer in the sport. Fast forward to the mid-1980s, and a small company with big league ambitions named Hoosier Racing Tires, headed by Bob Newton, is starting to make a name for themselves in the local short track racing scene. Although there was no exclusive deal worked out between Goodyear and NASCAR, the two sort of run a de facto partnership, where NASCAR wasn't exactly lending any help to new tire manufacturers looking to enter the top series. However, in 1986, a scare involving a hostile takeover of Goodyear threatens to nix the Goodyear racing program. Facing a lack of tires in the coming seasons, NASCAR encourages Hoosier to get ready for the big leagues so they can have a backup plan. Hoosier has to wait until the 1988 season to debut, but by this time Goodyear's problem is resolved. But why did it take so long to get the ball rolling for Hoosier? Well, two reasons. One is a rule NASCAR had put in place to protect Goodyear, stating that if anybody wanted to supply tires for a race, they had to provide enough tires to supply every race car for the entire weekend. This meant that any manufacturer had to show up with hundreds, sometimes over a thousand tires, to every single race. This is further compounded by the second problem that Hoosier faced, and that is in 1988, Goodyear had 350,000 full-time employees across the globe. Hoosier had just 16. Not 16,000, not 1,600, just 16. This seems completely insurmountable. This is the equivalent of if your dad and 15 of his buddies bought a fab shop downtown and said they were going to start making racing tires, and then announced out of nowhere that they were going to start competing against Pirelli in F1. It's just completely impossible. But then, not only do they actually put their money where their mouth is, they actually go out and win some races. As the 1987 season comes to a close, Hoosier immediately starts putting together their coalition. They can't pick off any of the big dogs, as most of them are in exclusive contracts with Goodyear. And those who aren't, well, they're not exactly willing to stick their necks out for a tiny company's hopes and dreams. Instead, they go prospecting for some newer guys at the Cup Series who have had limited success or haven't won at all yet, but show a lot of promise. Guys like Lake Speed, Morgan Shepard, and Rick Wilson. They do manage to poach off two big name guys though. Buddy Baker, who was running a part-time schedule this year with 19 career wins, but his team, a partnership between himself and Danny Schiff, had never won a race before. And Buddy Baker hasn't won a race in five years. He's in his mid-40s and by this point he's at the end of his career. His one good selling point though is that he's had three top fives and 10 top tens last year in just 20 starts. He can certainly wheel a race car around better than most. The other guy, 
is Neil Bonnet. Bonnet had won 16 races up to this point, but his last win came two years ago. His team, Raymock Enterprises, they haven't won since they last joined forces with Bonnet back in 1983. Despite all this, the venerable Bonnet will lead the vanguard for this ragtag bunch into battle, for better or for worse. Hoosier approached Neil because he had run their tires back during his short tracking days. There's history there, but Neil has also stated publicly that he'll start running good years as soon as they start looking better. As good a relationship as he has with Bob Newton and the Hoosier gang, he is by no means a Hoosier loyalist. The Hoosier Rebellion isn't looking too hot on paper, but as the checkered flag flies for the Daytona 500 to kick off the season, Neil Bonnet and Buddy Baker find themselves running 4th and ninth, respectively, having run solidly in the top 10 all day. While Hoosier's debut is overshadowed by Bobby Allison and Davey Allison's father-son 1-2 finish, it went about as well as they could hope. They made their name in the short track racing scene, and to run that good at a super speedway was honestly pretty surprising. Race 2 on the schedule, though, would be right in their wheelhouse. Richmond at the time was a half-mile short track, and Morgan Shepard won the pole for that race. Hoosier's first. That milestone would be quickly eclipsed, however, as Neil Bonnet would charge to the front, lead 141 laps, and win the race. Neil took Raymock Enterprises to victory lane for the first time in five years, and put Hoosier in the history books as the first tire manufacturer other than Goodyear to win in NASCAR since Firestone in the early 1970s. Neil's next two feats would be even more impressive. The third race of the year would be an exhibition race held in Melbourne, Australia at a 1.1 mile oval called the Thunderdome. No, I'm not making that up. Hoosier couldn't make the race, presumably both because they didn't want to spend the money to fly thousands of tires to the other side of the world, and the fact that Goodyear had the naming rights not only to the Thunderdome, but as the race title sponsor as well. But Neil would win the pole and eventually the race. He would use that momentum to win the next race, a points-paying race this time at Rockingham Speedway, back on Hoosiers again. Three weeks, three wins, and he only had to travel 24,000 miles to get it done. Hoosiers' star driver and his team, Raymock, are now the hottest name in NASCAR. People are already starting to talk about a championship run. Week 5, Atlanta. Goodyear comes loaded for bear and dominates the early practice sessions. Neil Bonnet and Buddy Baker's teams jump ship and go with Goodyear for this race. Only Rick Wilson and Lake Speed start the race on Hoosiers. Week 6, Darlington. Lake Speed rolls to his first and only victory and he does it while running on Hoosiers. Whatever Hoosiers' stated objectives were when they committed to running the 1988 season, they have now surely achieved or far surpassed them. They have three wins on the season in just five points paying races, and the good news doesn't stop there either. Hoosier never signed any drivers of their coalition to contact contracts. Every single one of them ran Hoosiers of their own free will. And now with their tire dominating the schedule, Goodyear drivers start clamoring to be released from their contracts so they can stay competitive. Shortly after Lake Speed's victory, they do just that. Just a handful of races into the 1988 season and Goliath has folded to David and now plays by his rules. It's a shocking upset by any measure. Goodyear now has to do something to win back their teams. They're getting their asses handed to them by 16 guys in a fab shop in Lakeville, Indiana. Week 11 and 12, Charlotte, the Winston All-Star Race, and the Coca-Cola 600. Goodyear's desperation gets the better of them and, well, everyone else for that matter. The Winston that year saw both Hoosier and Goodyear bringing to the table tires that were not up to the task that was asked of them, even in a shorter race format. The tires were fast but fell apart quickly. Two major blowouts happened. One ended Dale Earnhardt's day, but the other hurt Ricky Rudd's knee so bad that he had to be taken to the hospital. Both were running on Goodyear's. Two days later, Goodyear announces the unthinkable they would pull out of the 600 for that year. This sent teams scrambling and left beat reporters with their jaws on the floor. For the first time in three decades, a NASCAR race would not have Goodyear tires supported by anybody at the track. Fingers were starting to get pointed all around, and pretty soon they had a target. The head of Goodyear's racing program, Leo Mel. <laughs> He made the announcement that day on behalf of his company, and all it took was just one sentence to turn the NASCAR world against him. He never referred to the tire failures as blowouts. Instead, he insisted that the tires, quote, lost air rapidly. That PC bullshit ease didn't sit well with NASCAR fans, owners, drivers, or anybody else for that matter. And now favor shifted fully towards Hoosier. However, they too had underestimated the toll Charlotte Motor Speedway would take on their tires. Throughout midweek practice, Hoosier tires keep having problems, and soon Goodyear actually reverses their decision. Their Charlotte tire was noticeably worse than what Hoosier had brought to the table, so they decide instead to bring Daytona tires to the race. The tires are durable, but they are horrendously slow. Teams decide to stick with the Hoosiers. Goodyear just has one holdout, Dave Marcus, who qualifies outside the top 20. What ensued that Sunday afternoon was a complete and utter disaster. One by one, cars would move up to the front of the pack, 
only to cut a tire and end their day in a terrifying crash into the outside wall. Rick Wilson looked like he had it in the bag early, and then he creamed into the wall out of two. Harry Gant wound up with a compound fracture in his leg. Neil Bonnet, the hottest commodity in NASCAR at the time, would have a double whammy coming out of the second term and leave the track in an ambulance. Sterling Marlin lost a tire, smacked the wall, tried to limp around to the pits, but found out he had lost steering in turn three. And then Dave Marcus, the one man who had played it safe, launched off of his back bumper. For one horrifying split second, it looked as though Marcus would jump the wall and wind up in the parking lot. But a painful collision with the outside wall kept him on the track. He would walk away under his own power. Darrell Waltrip would win, but he would say in victory lane that it was emotionally the most difficult race he'd ever run. The normally jovial Waltrip didn't even look happy about his win. Instead, he looked like a man who had narrowly avoided a career-ending injury. Dave Despain on ESPN would call the race a kamikaze mission, and in his rundown of the event, he was noticeably disgusted with the ineptitude of the tire makers. The rest of the 1988 season would see similar displays of incompetence. Goodyear showed up to the June Pocono race with tires that were damn near a quarter inch too wide. Leo Mel would blame it on the elastic nature of the rubber and nylon used, an excuse no one bought. NASCAR told Goodyear to pack up their stuff, and for the first time since 1956, Goodyear's didn't turn a lap in a NASCAR Cup race. Although Hoosiers had some severe blistering, they suffered zero failures that day. In August at Watkins Glen, Hoosier would be bought for the exact same infraction and thus bow out of the event. The Goodyears would blister and fail all day long leaving nearly half the race run under yellow flag conditions. Its soul-saving grace was this fantastic final turn battle that almost made people forget about the tire failures that had plagued the garage all weekend. Dover comes around in September, and all the same problems that racked Charlotte come right back. Both suppliers have trouble with blistering tires, and Ken Schrader, Mark Martin, Richard Petty, and Alan Kowicki are all wrecked out of the event with blown tires. But at least this time, nobody got hurt. And all while this is going on, costs for teams and owners are skyrocketing. Not only because of all the wrecked race cars, but because teams never know which tire will be better. So they end up having to buy twice as many tires just in case one brand is safer or faster. Eventually, enough of a stink was made by drivers, owners, and the media after Dover that both manufacturers got their act together and the 1988 season ended without any more controversies. And the role the media played in this series of events cannot be understated. Because going into the 1989 season, for the first time ever, every single NASCAR race will be televised, live, flag to flag, on cable TV. The last thing NASCAR needs is for the embarrassment of the 1988 season to repeat itself and drive new viewers and fans away. Someone needs to win this damn tire war and send the other packing. In 1989, Goodyear thinks they have an answer. After years of testing, Goodyear announces they will run a radial tire instead of the normal bias ply tires that they and Hoosier have been running. A bias ply tire runs its cords diagonally across the tire, whereas radials run their cords perpendicularly. Radials are supposed to be on paper more grippy, and the only reason they haven't been run yet is they tend to get hotter and wear out faster. But Goodyear thinks they have that problem resolved. Speed Week's testing kicks off and immediately an issue arises. Dale Earnhardt, running the new radial, has a blowout and totals his car. His car owner, Richard Childress, immediately buys new sets of Hoosiers. Drivers might have bought that the failure was a one-off, but later Bill Elliott has a similar crash and breaks his wrist. The defending Cup Series champion won't even be able to finish the 500. He'll have to be replaced early on in the race. And that was the last straw. Only two drivers started the race on Goodyear's and Hoosier dominated the race with zero tire failures. Goodyear would go back to the drawing board and drum up old bias ply tires for the time being. But in April at North Wilkesboro, they bring back the radial tire. Rusty Wallace sits on the pole with Hoosiers, but as the green flag flies, it only takes about a dozen laps before he's swallowed up by the field. He switches to the radials at the first opportunity, and Dale Earnhardt wins with Goodyear's new radials. Hoosier, not having spent a dime researching radial tires and now getting their butts handed to them, yield in May and announce they will be exiting the sport immediately. They will not complete the 1989 season, but they won't be gone long. In 1993, just one day after the checkered flag flies on the final race of the season, Hoosier announces they will return for the 1994 season. Drivers and owners are not happy about it. They just want to race on one tire and not have to worry about weighing safety over speed every single weekend. Even still, NASCAR allows for the war to commence once more. Hoosier calls up its banners once again, and this time their coalition is far more impressive. Darrell Waltrip and Jeff Bodine, now both owner drivers, sign up. Kyle Petty, in the midst of a hot streak, defects for this round, and the Burton brothers also join the cause, along with Harry Gant and Rick Mast. And of course, Neil Bonnet is more than willing to hold the torch for the brand for the second war to come. As opening practice sessions begin on a sunny midday on the 11th of February, a screeching crash rings out of turn four, and then all falls silent. The garage quickly learns shortly thereafter that Neil Bonnet has died in a single car accident during his practice run. 
Questions are asked immediately about what happened to cause this, but no one has an answer. NASCAR calls for an independent investigation to see what happened. Everyone is stunned. Neil had made a name for himself in TV broadcasting during the early 90s, and was just entering six races this season on a part-time basis with Phoenix Racing. This was to be the swan song of his career, and it had cost him his life. Three days later, tragedy would strike again. Rodney Orr, a champion in the lower division dash series, died after his car went airborne in turn two and landed on its driver's side roof, caving in the cabin and killing him instantly. NASCAR would launch another investigation, but at this point, Speed Weeks is almost too much to bear for most drivers. These independent investigations would find out sometime later that both accidents were caused by broken shock mounts. But right there, in the heat of the moment, drivers were looking for answers where there seemed to be none. Both incidents were so different that there seemed to be nothing connecting the two of them. Neil drove a Chevy. Rodney drove a Ford. Neil's accident happened while on the ground. Rodney's had been in the air. Neil was a veteran. Rodney was a rookie. And Neil's accident had happened in turn four. Rodney's in turn two. No one could find any common link, except one. Both drivers were running Hoosier tires. Although NASCAR and the independent investigators were determined that tires were not the cause and Hoosier tires met all specifications, drivers at the time had no way of knowing that and made the call themselves. After the 125 qualifying races on Thursday before the main event, all drivers made the switch and no one started the Daytona 500 on Hoosiers. During the qualifiers, Hoosier drivers complained that the tires were unstable and slower than the Goodyear's. But according to pit reporters, Hoosier tires showed little wear and no blistering. Nonetheless, the 500 would not see a single driver make the transition to Hoosier rubber. The first third of the 1994 season would not go well for Hoosier. They were free of safety concerns during this stretch, and their tires were fast for all of about 10 laps. And then after that, they would start to slow down. Hoosier had a handful of poles, but no race wins. Not until Jeff Bodine won the All-Star race on Hoosiers and would remain a staunch Hoosier loyalist all the way till the bitter end. He would win his first points-paying race for Hoosier at Pocono in June, would follow it up with a win at Michigan in July, and a third win at North Wilkesboro in October, where he would lap the field, the last driver in NASCAR to ever do so. Bodine, however, would be the only driver to win any races for Hoosier during the 1994 campaign. By the time the season winds to a close, Hoosier only has five drivers left on the roster besides Bodine, and all of them are either rookies or veterans with a few wins between them. At the last race of the season, the Hooters 500 in Atlanta, Hoosier was hoping to take advantage of new pavement and go out with one last hurrah. Instead, it would end up being their death nail. There were three major blowouts during the race. All of them belonged to Hoosier, and oddly enough, all of them occurring in turn four. Greg Sachs would smack the wall but not be injured. Boy Allen, the rookie who had sat on the pole for the Daytona 500 for Hoosier to start the season, would end the season on a stretcher. And finally, Jeff Bodine, the flag bearer for the Hoosier cause and their star driver, would end his season in a fiery crash and would have to be pulled from his wreck and be carried to the medical center. With that, Hoosier's 1994 crusade came to an end in embarrassment and misery. One day later, they would announce they had no plans to run the 1995 season. And the last tire war in NASCAR finally came to a bloody end. Hoosiers, hey, they're here to stay, aren't they? Hey, this driver is the greatest, the greatest guy in the world. Matt Bear, I love you.